This is the seventh video about wind turbines. Uh, in our previous discussions of the actuator disk model and also the rotor disk model, uh, we were treating the rotor as a thin disk with zero thickness. Uh, we did not consider the exact shape of the rot rotor blades. In our discussion of the lift and drag forces in the third video, uh, we used a flat plate as an example, like this kind of thing, a flat plate. Right. And uh, if we actually tilt, this is a top-down view, it's a top-down view. If we actually tilt this flat plate at some angle uh, into the wind, we will get a force component that is actually perpendicular to the direction of the wind. And this force is called uh, lift, and it's called turning force on this figure, but in aerodynamics it's called a lift force. Right? Um, the, the exact size of the lift component, how large the force can be, uh, depends upon the angle, the angle between the incoming wind, the incoming wind direction, and the tilted plate. And this angle is sometimes called the angle of attack. Um, for flat plate, that's sort of the, the angle of attack is pretty much the only thing that we can actually control. Right? But for modern wind turbine, but for modern wind turbine blades, uh, they are not really flat plates. The cross sections of uh, modern wind turbine blade has the shape of an something that's called an airfoil. It's called an airfoil. In the fourth video, uh, we compared the power efficiencies of drag-based and lift-based wind turbines and showed that lift-based machines are usually much more efficient and drag than, than drag-based uh, machines. So the majority of modern horizontal axis wind turbines are all based on the lift force. Um, so, 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 so if it's based on the lift force, then when we design a wind turbine, we would like to actually maximize lift force while minimizing the drag force. Right? The drag force is not really that useful, so we would like to actually maximize the lift force. Um, an important reason for using airfoils as cross-sections of those wind turbine blades is to maximize the lift force while minimizing the drag force. For example, uh, uh, so, so, so in modern wind turbine, if you actually look at the cross-section from, from a perspective view, it would lie in this kind of direction. Right. If you look at the mast again from the top-down view, the cross section would look like a airfoil, right? Airfoil, and if it's, in, it's a front view, then it looks like that. So, so the front of the airfoil is in this direction, and then that's the tail. Right? Um, so, so for example, if you would like to minimize the drag force, maybe you can try to make the angle of attack exactly zero, right? For in this kind of situation, the wind actually comes in this direction. Right, so if you align the plate in the direction of the wind, right, in the direction of the wind, then the cross-sectional area as seen by the wind is essentially zero, right? So there is no obstacle that's blocking the, the wind at all. So right. But if if you are using a flat plate like this gray line here, then the lift force is also gonna be zero. You won't be able to create any kind of lift using a flat plate, right? If you actually orient the plate in this particular direction. But if you are using an airfoil, if you are using an airfoil, like this kind of black, black shape, the cross-sectional area as seen by the wind, this, this area, this area as seen by the wind, is still quite small, so the drag force created by the ring wind is um, still quite negligible. But if the, if, the, if the airfoil actually has this kind of shape, the kind of lift force that goes in this direction that's preventing the wind can still be quite significant. It could be quite a big if the airfoil has the correct shape, right? So, um, so in fact, in fact, to to optimize the performance, a modern wind turbine blade often uses airfoils with different shapes and sizes at different positions along the spin of the blade. This is called the spin of the blade, from the center to the tip. Right. This is called a span of the blade, and at different locations along the span, you could use different kinds of or different air, air foils with different shape, with different shape and different sizes. Right. Um, in this particular example, in this particular example that I found on the internet by this company, um, 
the shape of the airfoils are being optimized. The shape of the airfoils at different locations are actually being optimized to maximize the power output while minimizing the noise created by the, by the turbine. So in practice, the amount of noise created by the turbine is usually uh, proportional to the fifth to sixth power of the tip speed ratio. So if the turbine rotates even just a slightly faster, it can create a lot more noise, basically. So, but for the but from the fifth video, from the uh, fifth video, we know that the power efficiency of the wind turbine uh, increases uh, towards the best limit as we increase the tip speed ratio. So, by changing the shape of the airfoils along the span of the blade, we can actually reach a certain kind of balance at which uh, the power efficiency is maximized while the generated noise is still uh, acceptable. In order to characterize an airfoil, we need to introduce a few terms. Uh, the mean camber line, this dash line here, the mean camber line. The mean camber line is actually the locus of points uh, located halfway between the upper and the lower surface of the, uh, of the, of the airfoil. Uh, the most forward position and the rear most, most rearward position points of the mean camber line is called the leading edge and the trailing edge, respectively. The straight line, the straight line that connects the leading and trailing edge is called the chord line, the chord line. It's called the chord line. Um, and the distance from the leading to the trailing edge measured along the chord line is designated as the chord C. That's the chord C of the airfoil. The camber the camber is uh, the distance is the distance between the mean camber line and the chord line measured perpendicular to the chord line right that's the distance between the mean camber line and the chord and the, then the thickness the thickness is the distance between the upper and lower surface also measured perpendicular to the chord line so here chord line right mean camber line and then uh, the leading edge, the trailing edge, the camber, the thickness, and the chord. These are some new names. About the, those are some of the names that we, that we must be familiar with to discuss the airfoil. In reality, the turbine blade is not stationary. So it rotates, right? If it rotates, it must have a velocity. The wind also has a velocity, right? If the if the blade is stationary, then the 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 relative velocity between the blade and the wind is just the wind velocity. But now, if the if the blade is actually turning, if it's rotated, if it it's rotating and it has a velocity, then we have to sort of uh, calculate the relative speed between the wind and the rotating uh, blade, right? So that's what we really care about. It's actually the relative velocity between the blade and the wind. Because the velocity because the velocity is a vector, so the relative velocity between the wind and the blade uh, can be ob obtained from the vector subtraction between the wind velocity and the blade velocity following the uh, parallel par parallel parallelogram law. Um, the angle between the relative wind, uh, relative wind speed. So the angle between the relative wind speed, uh, so it's denoted as W here, right? And the chord line of the airfoil is called the angle of attack. It's called the angle of attack. That's the angle of attack. Uh, the real, the real wind speed direction cannot be controlled. But the angle of attack can be adjusted by changing the pitch of the blade, by by rotating the blade not not in the direction of the, not in the direction of in this kind of direction, but 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 rotating the blade along an axis that goes through the the span, basically rotating the blade, basically twisting the blade, right, along an axis that goes like that. That's the axis of the rotation. So you you turn the blade back and forth in and out of the screen, basically, like, like that. By changing that, uh, by changing the pitch, you can control the, uh, op uh, 
control the angle of attack. Um, by changing the angle of attack, uh, we can actually maximize the lift and drag ratio. So the lift over drag ratio actually depends upon the angle of attack. Right? So by, by, by changing the angle of attack, we can actually reach a maxima. We can reach a maxima, find the optimal angle of attack so that the lift drag ratio is maximized. Um, the, the question is that why the airfoil has such a unique shape, right? It looks quite strange. Right? Uh, and how exactly does it actually create a lift forces, even when the angle of attack could be zero, right? So when we, are, when we were discussing the Bernoulli's equation, we studied the pressure and the velocity along the same string line by examining the forces acting on a, a very small fluid particle. Right. To understand the shape and the behavior of an airfoil, we need to study the pressure change across a curved streamline. Right. It's no longer following along the streamline. We have to study the pressure change across this kind of a curved streamline. Right. Um, so to understand the, um, so now now let's uh, let's examine the forces acting on this very small fluid particle, cubic fluid particle, right? We 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 will denote the pressure at the bottom of this uh, particle as uh, p inside, and it has a value of p. Um, and the pressure at the top side of the particle is denoted as p outside, and it's denoted it has a value of p plus dp. Um, so the changing pressure, so the changing pressure from the bottom to the top, this uh, this amount of dp, we can actually express it as the height of the cube, which is h, the height of multiplying the rate of change of pressure along this direction, this direction that goes from bottom to top, and we call this direction the normal direction. Why we are calling it the normal direction? Because it's perpendicular to the local tangent of the streamline. And it goes from like bottom to top. So, 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 so the rate of change along this particular direction for the pressure can be expressed as this directive. So dp over dn tells you how fast pressure actually changes along this direction. Right? And then you multiply this rate of change with the distance h, you get the amount of change, dp, in pressure, right? So, so we're going to represent the pressure change using this, uh, using this particular direct derivative. Right? And because this particle is actually moving along a curved streamline, right, so it's, it's direction, the, the, the direction of its velocity actually is actually changing constantly. Right? The direction of its velocity is changing constantly. Right? So you, you, you will require a, a centripetal force centripetal force in order to actually uh, uh, in order to actually make the make the fluid to, to, to go along a curved path. Right? We denote this centripetal centripetal uh, force as F. And Newton's law tells us that, that Newton's second law tells us that F equals to M times the acceleration. M is the mass, A is the acceleration, right? And for centripetal force the acceleration actually is called centripetal acceleration. It has a specific form. It's a speed. It's a linear speed, not angular speed. It's a linear speed squared divided by big R. Big R is the rotation radius. It's the distance from the particle to the center of the curvature. So if you have a if you have a curvature, right, you you, you can draw a circle. You can draw a circle with the exact same curvature and pass the same point. And the radius of that circle is big R. That's the curvature. That's the radius of the, uh, the, the that's the radius of the sphere that passes through that point and with that the same curvature at the same point. Right? So there is a quite good YouTube video located at this position that explains why the centripetal acceleration actually has this kind of form. Right? But if we accept that's the truth, right? And then we can uh, follow our derivations. So now the centripetal force has this particular form, right? 
But on the other hand, on the other hand, the centripetal force can also be expressed as the pressure difference between the upper and the lower bottom, uh, upper and lower surfaces, which is dp, right? dp, multiplying the cross-sectional area, which is capital A, right? So the force equals to pressure difference multiplying the cross-sectional area. And then dp, we have an expression for dp right here, in terms of the great, uh, in terms of the derivative, in the in the direction that's normal to the uh, that's normal to the streamline, right? So we bring, just bring this equation here into this to represent dp. So s becomes a times h dp over dn. Right? And don't forget, don't forget, f also equals to the centripetal force also equals to m times v squared divided by r. And m is the mass. Mass equals to density times volume, right? So density rho is the density of the air, right? A times h, that's the volume of the cube. A is the area, h is the height, right? So both both terms must equal to each other. So at this point, we can cancel out a times h, a times h. So dp over dn equals to what? Equals to density times v squared divided by r, right? So so this equation basically tells us how fast or in what kind of direction is it increasing or is it reducing in the direction that's normal to the string line. Right? And because v squared v square is a positive number, right? R is a positive number if we look at uh, this figure. Right? And density is a positive number. So dp over dn is actually a positive number, which means what? Which means the pressure increases in the direction of the normal direction. If it increases, then it means the p outside is larger than p inside. So if we actually translate the entire analysis into plain English, it means what? It means if a streamline is curved, there must be a pressure gradient. A pressure gradient is just a pressure difference. Gradient is just like a difference. A pressure difference across the streamline with the pressure increasing in the direction away from the center of the curvature. The center of the curvature is right here, down below, right? That's the center of the curvature. So the pressure is increasing in the direction away from the center of the curvature. That's along the normal direction that's pointing up, right? So, so once we have this kind of understanding, it's easier for us to, it's, uh, it's easier for us to understand why the, 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 the airfoils have, um, have its, uh, have its uh, unique shape. But before we look at an ordinary airfoil, let's look at this uh, curved plate, a curved solid plate, but it's actually curved. It's not a flat plate anymore. It has a curvature to it. It has a curvature to it. So the flow direction is horizontal and from the left to right. And we are looking at a cross-section view. So it's a cross-section view. Um, the angle of attack for this particular example is actually zero, right? So, so you do have a zero angle of attack. And because uh, because the flow the flow the airflow cannot actually penetrate through the solid plate, so it must bend around it. The shape of the curved plate effectively displaces the streamlines around it. Right. So so the airflow cannot go through it. So it must bend around it. So the existence of this solid curved plate just displaces those uh, streamlines just around it. Right. Suppose, suppose, uh, suppose at position A and position C, uh, the pressure. This is very far from the, from from the from the airfoil, from the plate, from the curved plate, right? We assume that the, at position A and C, the pressure is the ambient atmospheric pressure. So as we move from point A to point B, right? So we are moving against the normal direction of the curvature, right? The normal direction of the curvature points up, because it's curved like that. The streamlines are curved in this way, so the normal direction must point up, right? And must point upward. So from A to B, we are actually uh, moving against the normal direction. So the pressure must drop. Must uh, we, we must reduce? The pressure must be reducing along this particular path, right? And as we move to position B, the 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 the, the pressure must have dropped uh, quite significantly from the pressure at position A. And we know that at position A, the pressure is the ambient atmospheric pressure, right? 
And then we also move from position C to position D, right? So as we move from position C to D, we are moving in the same direction as the normal direction. So the pressure must increases, right? The pressure must increases. So as we move to position D, the pressure must have been a much, uh, significantly larger than the pressure at position C, which we know is actually the ambient pressure. Right? So at position D, the pressure is larger than ambient pressure, and at the position B, the pressure is smaller than the ambient pressure. So the pressure at position B must be smaller than the pressure at position D. And it's this kind of a pressure difference above and below this curved plate that actually creates that actually creates a, a net force that goes up, the net lift force that goes up. So so the shape of the airfoil is pretty much just designed to displace the streamlines around it in specific ways. And it has to be smooth enough, right? So you cannot introduce any kind of abrupt changes to the flow. So that's why the air force take its unique shape. It has to be smooth enough without to, to, to avoid introducing any kind of abrupt change to the flow. And its curvature is used to displace the streamlines around it so that you can create uh, some kind of a differential pressure above and below the air board. Right? So you can create a lift force. So the curvature of the bended streamlines is very important to the generated uh, lift force. If we have a thin airfoil that looks like that, right, the stream the streamline above it and the streamlines below it all bend in the same direction. So the streamlines above it bends in this direction, it goes like that, right? And then the streamline below it also bends in the same direction, right? So as we move closer to the airfoil from below, do, doing this, right? Then the pressure uh, increases, right? And then as we move closer to the airfoil from above, the, pre the, pre the pressure decreases, right? So in this kind of case, in this kind of case, uh, because the curvature above and below the airfoil is kind of in the same direction, right? We get a larger differential pressure above between the two surfaces. Right? But if we actually consider a thicker airfoil, like this kind of example, right? the, the streamlines above the airfoil still bend in the same way, just like the above the thin airfoil. Right? But the streamlines below the thick airfoil actually bends in a different direction. It doesn't bend upward anymore, it actually bends downward. Right? So as we move from very far distance to the lower surface, in this direction, right? it's actually going against the normal direction. Right? It's actually going against the normal direction of the curvature. Right? So the pressure also reduces. Right? So if the far distance at far distance is ambient pressure, then at the lower at the lower surface, it's also a pressure that's slightly below the ambient pressure. The difference is that above the Above the above the above the airfoil, the pressure is reduced by a bigger amount than the pressure that's below the airfoil. So, so in this case, you do not actually get a very large pressure difference as compared with this very thin airfoil. Right? In this very thin airfoil, the pressure difference could be quite large, but for this very thick airfoil the pressure difference uh, is not as large. Right? Um, so the thickness of the airfoil is, uh, is important. And in practice, uh, sometimes we do use this kind of thick airfoil because it's easier to manufacture structurally. Right? This kind of thin airfoil has difficulties in, uh, there are some structural difficulties when actually manufacturing such a uh, thin airfoil. Another very important thing is the angle of attack. The angle of attack. So this example is a perfectly symmetric airfoil. So the surface that's uh, up, so the so the so the 
so upper surface and the lower surface are exactly symmetric, right? So if the angle of attack is exactly zero, then the curvature above and below the below the airfoil is exactly the same, but exactly in the uh, in the opposite direction, right? So there is no pressure difference above and below the airfoil. So in this kind of case, you don't have any kind of lift force created. But if you actually have a positive angle of attack, if you tilt the airfoil this way, then you have a curvature difference, right? You have a curvature difference above and below the airfoil. And in this case, you will create a lift force that goes up, uh, goes, uh, goes above, goes up, goes up. But if you actually change the angle of attack to a negative angle, you tilt the air, uh, the airfoil downward like that. Then the lift force also changes its direction. It goes down now. It's not going up anymore. Right. So by just changing the direction of the, by by just the changing the sign of the angle of attack, you can change the direction of the lift force. You wanna if you wanna go make it go up, or if you wanna make it go down. Right. And this kind of situation is useful when you try to fly an airplane upside down. If you try to fly an ups airplane upside down, you do need to have a, a lift force that actually uh, goes in the direction that's um, kind of like counterintuitive. And the size of the angle of attack is also important, right? Um, so as we increase the, so in this sequence of pictures, we are actually increasing the angle of attack gradually, right? So at this shot, at this kind of kind of a a snapshot, so the angle of attack is quite low. It's a small angle of attack, right? But as we increase the angle of attack gradually, more streamlines, more streamline curvature is introduced above the airfoil, and more lift forces is created. However, when the angle of attack reaches a certain threshold, a critical point, the streamline, the streamlines above the airfoil can no longer uh, follow this very sharp curvature, and they are sort of detached or separated from the upper surface. Uh, you can sort of see it from the picture here, right? The, the streamline here is still following the upper surface, right? But here the streamline is not following the upper surface at all. It's detached from it. It's separated from it. You have this kind of wide open space here. There's no streamline actually goes through it, right? And at this point, the airfoil is going to experience a very sudden drop in lift force. And this phenomenon is called a stall. So when flying an airplane, a stall can be uh, highly dangerous. But for wind turbines, you can actually use stall to protect the turbine when the wind speed goes above a certain limit. And all we need to do is to actually just increase the angle of attack by changing the pitch of the blades. 